Welcome to the Music and Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily williams Birch, and this podcast, it exists for you. Whether you're a music lover, an educator, a choir member, each week we bring guests to the show to help explore what matters in music. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Music Ed Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily williams Birch, and you're going to want paper, a pencil, and a little bit of time to sit and absorb every amazing piece of information in this episode. You're about to meet one of my new friends, Dr. Francis Catalina. Dr. Catalina works at the University of Memphis and did part of his um, doctoral work in the area, specifically of vocal pedagogy. This episode is like a fast blast vocal pedagogy class, but broken down into seven essential tips for developing voices in choir. I don't want to give any of it away, but I literally took as many notes as I've ever taken, and I cannot wait to walk into rehearsal and use some of these things. Why is this important? Why should you stick it out for the big words and the scientific stuff? As Dr. Kathleen says, by giving these tools to our stingers, to our students, we're allowing them the opportunity to show up confident and capable and to use their best voice. We are committing to helping them be their best selves. So let's do it together. This episode is brought to you by our friends from Kaleidoscope Adventures and the Kennison Coral Company. If you're looking for something to do next summer, say the first weekend in June, join Alex Gardner and myself up in Myrtle Beach. We're having a festival. It's going to be awesome. There'll be singing and professional development and, of course, beach and sand and fun and all that stuff. And because you've taught your kids all these essentials for developing voices in choir, they're going to really have a great time with their confident voices. Anyway, that is plenty for me. I cannot wait for you to hear this incredible vocal pedagogy-focused episode with Dr. Francis Kathleen. Today... On the Music Ed Matters podcast, we are talking to the one and only Dr. Francis Catalina. Hello, my friend. Hello, it's great to be here. I'm so excited for this moment. We connected at a summer conference in Tennessee, and it was like sparks. I just knew we were going to be friends. Fast friends. Fast friends. And then you said you come (laughs) on the podcast, and I was like, yay, we can have a Get to Know You podcast. But then the best part, not only do we get to know you, You have seven essential tips for developing voices in choir, which we all need to hear right now. Oh, my goodness. That is very kind of you. Well, the seven essentials that I think are useful in developing voices are one, the choral warm up, two, alignment or posture, three, breathing and support, four, tone, five, the choral blend, six, musical acuity, and of course, number seven, the conductor's model and gesture. Oh, okay. We're going to dive deep into these. But I feel like having such a clearly and concisely given outline like that, there's got to be some good stories behind you. So tell us, how did you get into choir world? That's a great question. I actually didn't start in choir. I started playing the viola and I played in an orchestra. I played the viola for 14 years. And yeah, and it wasn't until I was, I started in fifth grade and it wasn't until high school when my high school choir director, I say my, the high school choir director said, you should join choir. And this was my 10th grade year. And there were not a lot of Asian people in choir and there were, there were a lot of Asian people in orchestra. So I felt very at home there. And yet he pressed me over and over and he was like, just join, try it for a year. Well, I joined, I fell in love. And that, that medium of choral artistry is so different from the orchestral realm. There's the text that we have, the, the, kind of person that is attracted to choir is also very different than orchestral musicians and I love both of them and I was just more of a choral nerd and so I joined choir and then when I got to my freshman year of college I was told I had to decide I either go on as viola music education or you know vocal music education and I chose choral music education and best decision of my life besides burying my husband best decision Uh-oh. of my Good life job. 
Good job putting that caveat in. I would have missed that caveat and gotten in trouble later. Spence, thanks for listening. I love you. <laughs> Make sure he gets the shout out. So when you think back, do you still get out your viola? Do you still use things from those 14 years of orchestra and transfer it over to the choral world? Absolutely. They're the transfer of ideas, the transfer of musical concepts, the musicianship tips. I would say that I, because I played the viola for so long, uh, my sight reading abilities are mm. different and I conceptualize reading differently. I will sometimes on difficult sight reading passages, I will still, my fingers will play it on the viola while I'm singing because I can mm -hmm. hear and, and feel the intervals on my fingers. Uh, I also think there's so much that we can learn from observing orchestral conductors and listening to the way that they utilize words to communicate concepts. And so uh, it enriched my abilities in a choral rehearsal and uh, I still go and observe my colleague, the director of orchestral activities at U of M. I still go and observe his rehearsals because it's inspiring to me. Oh, I love it. Well, you know, my doctorate's in conducting, period. Not choral conducting, not... So I actually took more orchestral conducting classes than I did choral conducting classes because I wanted to work serious? on that side. Oh, it's wonderful. I also have two doctoral minors. I want some place that I could really customize my degree and Oh my goodness. It was so much fun. But I love what you're saying because I could never identify why it felt so different on the podium in front of the orchestra. Yes, I was exceptionally nervous. But you're of right, course. it's a different conceptualization of the music. Yeah. Okay. It is. I have an important question. Ask who in away. your family told you to play the viola? Like who shoved you into orchestra in the first place? You know, I I, I grew up in a I grew up in a very large family. There's seven of us. And there are, I have four other siblings. My older sister played, she was the one that started violin. And I looked up to her. She is still one of my best friends. I adore her. I love her. And she played violin. So I was like, well, I want to be in orchestra with my sister. So I picked up viola. And then my younger three brothers all played piano. And and my parents, you know, they're, they're immigrants from Vietnam. So my first language, this is a fun fact about me, my first language is not English. It's actually Vietnamese. And I went through the I went through ESL in elementary school and I actually really struggled learning the English language. Really? Yeah, yeah. Well, y'all, so, life lesson number one. You struggled learning English and now you have a doctorate and you've done a dissertation and you're you're leading like hello. That's amazing. Well, Thank you. Thank you. No, I, I, my parents are incredible. And the, the hardships that they went through, you know, they, they still say to this day, they went through the hardships to give us a beautiful and easier life. And my parents knew always growing up that there, that music was a valuable asset. And so they were the ones who said, you know, we can't afford for you to do sports and music. So we're just going to have you all do music instead. And so that's what kind of put me on the path of, okay, what do I want to do? What instrument do I want to play? And viola was the one. Wow. Okay. So thanks, big sister. Thanks, mom and yeah. dad. Awesome. Yeah. And you did it all through those 14 years. Can I ask another kind of interesting question you don't have to answer? Of course. Ask away. You brought it up that when you went into choir as a sophomore, that the first thing that you noticed or one of the first things was that there weren't as many Asian students in the room and you are, mm -hmm. you have your heritage. What was that like? It was interesting because there was, you know, as with all people of color, there's an aspect of code switching that happens naturally, especially in school systems, especially in educational institutions where we feel like we have to assimilate to the larger population. And for me, I, I went to a largely Mormon white school in Houston, Texas, in Spring, Texas, actually. And so I did a lot of assimilating, a, a lot of code switching just to blend in. And I look back on that time in my life where there was a lot of denial of my heritage, like, I, how do I not act to Vietnamese? And how do I just bring more of, of what my colleagues, what my peers are bringing to the table so that I would be accepted? And, you know... Mm -hmm. I, we do what we have to do in, in our respective situations. And at this point in my life, having gone through my 20s, you know, being an adult, taking more ownership of my heritage, I am so proud that I'm Vietnamese. And I hope that in my work that 
I get to interact with more Asian students that see an Asian, a Vietnamese conductor that inspires them to go, maybe I can do that one day too, Mm -hmm. because we know, uh, you know, and as you're nodding so vehemently, it's representation matters for, for what our students see in their potential dreams. I have goosebumps as you're saying it, because it's such that code switching. I've never thought of it like that, but you did it so seamlessly and to now be able to own your heritage and be in that space so others can feel seen. That's incredible. Thank what you. was what was the did your friends in orchestra ever give you any grief for moving into the choral side? You know, they never did. They I, I I'm still friends with some of the fre- the orchestral friends I made in high school and middle school. And no, of course they didn't. They they were grateful for that friendship and I just developed other friendships and we kind of parted ways but I learned so much from them and you know there was an essence being surrounded by more Asian students and orchestra that just allowed for me to live into that heritage more and and I'm grateful for that I'm grateful for my orchestral directors that I continue to draw upon for wisdom in what they taught me in those formative elementary middle school high school years. So if someone's listening and they have a Vietnamese population or an Asian population yeah. in their school and they're not, what are some ways that they can help those students feel seen? Oh, that is such a great question. And so much of good podcasting is are great questions by the host. So I'm so, so grateful that you asked that. For, for friends and colleagues out there that do teach Vietnamese students, I think honor, helping them bring their heritage into the classroom, asking them, what is it like for your family to have dinner? What does that look like? You know, what, you know, asking them individual questions about their own experiences and bringing that into the classroom as a learning experience. So for me, what that looks like is during class, during rehearsals, of course, we'll use analogies to inspire our singers to achieve some kind of concept. And for me, many of those concepts come from my Vietnamese heritage. So there are Vietnamese proverbs that I will teach to my choirs as a way to help them understand the concept that we're we're working on in this Brahms piece or in this Tormis piece, right? And so drawing upon these life experiences bringing them into the classroom, that honors the students and and where they come from and just helps them take a little bit or not have to code switch as much in that choral rehearsal. And that's something someone can do without having to seek out others. They can simply embrace almost that student and help them find a place. Exactly, exactly. And and asking them questions and say, hey, can I share that with the classroom? Would you be comfortable with that? And if the student says yes, then there, there's an excellent example of how we increase, you know, cultural sensitivity and, and, and allow for that cultural sharing to happen. I love that cultural sensitivity and cultural sharing. Well, you, you tapped into it slightly. You talked about Brahms. Tell us a little bit about the choirs that you have. You said you use some of your Vietnamese proverbs. What choirs do you conduct and what type of music do you like doing with them? Yeah, I, at the University of Memphis, I conduct University Singers, which is our flagship mixed uh, choir ensemble, SATB. And that's about 36 to 40 voices. This year it's 36 voices. And, the, and then I also conduct Mazi. Mazi is a treble choir here at the University of Memphis. Mazi means together in Greek. And mm. this choir is has voice majors, non-majors, has all of them. And actually all of our choirs have non-majors as well. But uh, a lot of the, the repertoire that we do is I, I program from different parts of the world. I try to program different languages. So within a program at any given time, I try to program three to four, maybe five different languages, which by the nature of that, different cultures, Mm -hmm. um, different style periods, different tempi as well. So the students within a program get to explore a variety of composers. And of course I balance that with composers of color, female composers. I did my dissertation on Elaine Hagenberg, so she is near and dear to my heart. And lovely um, music, lovely, lovely music. Yes, yes. So good. And teachable, beautiful to sing, fulfilling for the singers. 
Oh, I love this. Okay, and you it ties so perfectly into what you were just sharing, how we draw in everyone from our from our groups to create the community so they all feel seen and you do that also through your repertoire. Mm-hmm. Is that where these seven essentials for developing voices came? Where did where did the idea for this concept where did these ideas come from? You know, this came from my time at North Texas, University of North Texas. I had this exceptional I did my my cognate in uh, vocal pedagogy and Mm. I had this exceptional professor who just really invested in me and I learned so much under him. I studied voice with him. I studied, I took all of his vocal pedagogy classes and I developed such a passion for it. And even before when I taught public school, I was very passionate about our singers being able to use their voices effectively so that they are confident in the performance. They're confident in their ability to stand on stage and deliver a compelling performance. And so in my time at North Texas, I really delved into that vocal pedagogy side. And from my scholarship surrounding that, this piece of, uh, you know, presentation emerged. And um, yeah, it's been, it's been wonderful just hearing offering this wisdom to other colleagues and learning from them about this. And, and so that's where this came from. I love it. Okay. So can we dive into step number one? Yes, absolutely. You know, I, I first, it, as I talked about, I preempt this whole presentation by saying that the importance, uh, why is it important to develop voices in choir? And, and the answer lies in the students self-expression and self-esteem. Right. And so I, I talk about in this in this model of seven essentials, that te- vocal technique that is rooted in a scientific understanding of the voice and backed by historical pedagogy, right? What has been done for many centuries and what continues to work, vocal technique is imperative in helping the singers navigate the complexities of a rehearsal setting and to find ultimately joy in what we do. And so, you know, the, the quote that I share with my students, with Um, with future educators is that by committing to beautiful choral tone production, everything else in the music, all of its other merits are amplifying. And so knowing that, knowing that the most musical thing our singers can do is to sing well, these are seven, these seven essentials of the warm up, posture or alignment, breathing and support, tone, choral blend, musical acuity, and the conductor's model and gesture emerged. And so for the first one, and stop me at any point, Emmy. No, I got it. I'm, I'm writing questions. notes like crazy. So yeah. I love this. I, I'm going to quote you. I'm going to make a quote card on why it's okay. so important to develop it because that was so good. So number one is warm up and number two is posture, but we're just going to go with number one. Tell us about the warm up. Yeah, yeah. So the warm up is, of course, similar to a physical exercise. How do we start rehearsal? I generally tell pedagogues that when we start rehearsal, there has to be a minimization of of the collision of the vocal folds, meaning we don't want to start them singing loud on an ah vowel. And so I always start the singers on semi-occluded vocal tract exercises, which what are semi-occluded vocal tract exercises? They are, great question, they are an exercise where the mouth is partially obstructed. So you think of a lip trill, Mm -hmm. tongue trill, Mm -hmm. humming, Phonation through a straw. You know this. You know what Dr. I'm like Birch, over here you know thinking. This. No, I'm like, I hope I'm doing this right. You can ask my singers every single time we start with. Because <laughs> I just yes. love seeing them relax into it. And that's such just an icebreaker in and of itself. But okay, yes. what are those things called again? One more time with the fancy pedagogy behind it. Yeah, yeah, it's called semi-occluded. So half, half closed vocal tract exercises. I'm going to whip that out in rehearsal next week. And the kids are going to be like, what? <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm going to type it to you so you have it. There you go. Yes. Some of you included vocal tract exercises. But, you know, it, the warm-up process, and I also tell everyone, it should be a concert of individuality. We shouldn't be asking for blend at the onset of rehearsal because we want the singers to have full access to their tonal spectrum, to their color spectrum. And so I often tell them, sing like you do during your studio classes. Sing like you do during your voice lessons. We want to hear that at the start. And then as the warm-up goes on, then we start to narrow towards our ideal sound more and more. I'm so thankful that you said that because one of my biggest pet peeves word is blend. 
I think that mm-hmm. just destroys the whole point of community and making people feel seen. It's not about blend. It's about helping them explore what freedoms and what space they have and how that can come together. I'm, I'm so glad you're saying these things. You know, and this, this ties into what we talked about, allowing each youth to bring themselves into the choral rehearsal. Like mm-hmm. you just said so beautifully, the choral blend, when we ask them to match everyone and, and be quiet, there's a, there's, and we'll get into this in the later aspects of the seven essentials, but there's a way to achieve blend without asking them to shrink their voice to the point where you can't recognize, uh, you know, their contribution to the overall sound. So, so yeah, but we'll get more Thank into you. choral blend. I I, we're this. on the same page. Yay. Okay. So warm up, semi, semi occluded, occluded. I'm going to have to yes. say that about eight times between now and next <laughs> so, semi occluded vocal track exercises. Yes, yes. Yes. Or in short, known as SOVTs. Oh, thanks. I'm always great for a good acronym. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so much easier. Okay. And so after you've gotten them singing freely, what are some of the other things after you've done those lip trolls and such? Where do you go from there? Yeah. So I, we talk about, I talk about the ideal dynamic, understanding what is the ideal dynamic for warming up. And uh, I always ask this question. Do you, I mean, do you know what the mm-hmm. ideal dynamic is? It's actually mezzo forte because okay. that is when they're singing the most uninhibited, the most free, you know, piano is really hard to sing. As you know, forte right. is asking a lot. It's like going to the gym and going for the heaviest dumbbell first. So mezzo forte. I despise when people do that too. They walk right up to the weight bar, whip up some heavy weights, do a couple like grunts and then walk off. They've just ruined oh, the man. gym for me. I Don't know. do that with your I'm voices. Like, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So then from there, we can talk about more age appropriate warmups. What does it look like for to warm up a middle school choir versus warming up a high school mm-hmm. choir versus warming up college students mm-hmm. uh, versus professional singers? So, you know, in general and in, in my research, I found that the most successful warmups for all ages have four components. One, a logical sequence. Two, student choice. Do they get to make their own decisions as well? So for this, it's like, okay, here's a one chord. Everybody pick do, me, or so and sing that, right? Their student choice. It allows for them to express their individuality. Rel- of course, relationship between the warm-up and repertoire and then a variety of activities. All right. So after we've done our SOVTs, we yeah. then have a logical sequence where their student mm-hmm. choice and then what was three and four? I was too excited. I stopped writing. <laughs> no, that's okay. Three is a relationship between the warm up and the repertoire. So, so the transfer how, piece. Exactly. Like, that's mm-hmm. exactly it. The transfer piece. And then number four is a variety of activities addressing all aspects of their vocalism in this warm up process. Okay. So you're covering all the voice. It's it's like a good warm up, just like you're gonna go for a run. You better get all the muscles going or you might feel not so good once you're in it. That's that's exactly it. Making sure you warm up every part of the range, that you've addressed every part of the range. And, um, you know, if when we look back at the beginning of rehearsal, I also talk about non-pitched vocalization exercises, meaning, you know, for middle school singers where their voices are still developing and one day it could all of a sudden drop for tenors and basses, Non-pitched exercises are an excellent way for these students to also achieve success at the onset of rehearsal. So instead of saying, everybody sing this pitch, it can be everybody go, woo, you know, and there's no specific pitch that they're aiming for at the first start of rehearsal. And then, like we talked about, as rehearsal goes on, we slowly narrow towards where we want to develop their voices. But that's a consideration as well for our middle school, our elementary friends, where the students' voices are all over Going the place. Going all over the place. I know. I had a kid last night who was struggle bussing because he yeah. lost a couple of his favorite notes and yes. he is not enjoying the voice change. And he's like, these are not easy to find today. Oh. It's okay. It's okay. They'll come back, I promise. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. That's exactly so right. All right. So our voices are warmed up. We've done the funnel. We started big on S O T S O V T S, and yes. now I'm gonna. I'm getting it. That's. I think that's time <laughs> five. We're getting close. So now we get into that's number awesome. two. What's number two? Yeah. Number two is alignment. 
Okay. And this is also synonymous with posture. You know, the term alignment in my research emerged as the more fruitful term because posture, when you tell students stand with good posture, they will puff up their shoulders, push their chest mm-hmm. out, you know, and it invokes the term alignment just invokes a calmer positioning of the bones. So when you say stand with tall alignment, then the students just naturally fix their skeletal, their skeleton instead of like muscular, uh, you know, yes, exactly. So <laughs> we're all seeing you know, it too right now. I guarantee you absolutely. everyone's seeing that kid. That's like, I have great posture. <laughs> I know. And those, and that poor child is doing his best for the choir director. Yes, I love it. And they don't know, they don't know yet. <laughs> alignment, alignment. Alignment. And, and so, you know, Anne Howard Joan says that singing does not come out of a static body. So mm-hmm. singing is, you know, I mean, I know you run a lot, right? And so mm-hmm. singing is athletic as well. It requires the activation of some muscles and the release of others. And so there, it should not be completely loosey-goosey. And singers will feel different sensations. So you know, for my college director friends out there, I often say that our job as collegiate directors is to emphasize the release of muscles and then let the voice teachers, let our voice colleagues emphasize what they should engage and how they mm. should feel. What a great but, relationship uh, there. That's a great yeah. way of looking at that relationship. So it's collaborative. Correct. Correct. And and our teaching aligns, our teaching reinforces Uh, each other's pedagogy. And of course, you know, I taught high school for many years too. I taught public school. And so when you are the only voice teacher, well, then you should really understand the vocal mechanism to where you are the one providing, Mm -hmm. okay, how do I teach my students support? How do I teach them a clean phonation? So then your role has to just change depending on where you are currently. Mm. This is great. So it's different for every one of the of the levels, knowing who's in front of you. So we have the warm up, which you've given us great detail. Mm-hmm. Alignment. What's three? Three is breathing and support. How do we start the mechanism? How do we power the engine? And so there are three principles of breathing pedagogy that are considered sound by historical literature and by modern scientific studies. So are you ready for one? I'm ready. <laughs> Number one is that full use of the abdomen and the chest is necessary for good breathing. And uh, so much of 20th century choral pedagogy ignored the contribution of the chest, right? We, I mean, how many of us had choir directors that said, just expand your abdomen, your chest shouldn't move? Right. And I know, weird. like, I'm thinking about, like, I always have them bring their rib cage out so I can see that they're moving their rib cage. But you saying the chest moving... I just breathe differently than I have mm-hmm. in quite some time. But you're not giving yourself enough credit. I mean, I, I saw you do a warm up, and you are you absolutely reinforce that in the singers at Tennessee. Modeling, ACA, so. you're sweet modeling, but I I think it's so important too. We as teachers that we get re- reminded and refed, and I just like that terminology of the abdomen and the chest. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah, and I so thank you. there is, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm being honest, and there is a, a right order to doing it. So one, the, the diaphragm has to contract, meaning that the diaphragm releases, and that's when the, the wall lowers. And then the abs have to relax, and that's when the abs, you know, the abdomen expands outward. And then there's an expansion of the chest cavity afterwards. So the order matters. If we see our singers expanding chest cavity first, that's an indication that their breathing breathing pedagogy is not quite uh, in, in the right order. And so that is also important in this first point. Order matters. Order matters. Abs relax, expansion of the chest. That's it. That's I it. I have a wrap coming on, but I'll save it for later. I love it. Okay, I'm going to ask you to demonstrate later. I'm ready for it. <laughs> okay, what happens okay. after? So sure, three sure. Principles. Number two. Full abdomen and yep. chest. What's two? Yep. Two, opposing muscular forces must be balanced. So when we inhale and then once we start exhaling, there's the activation still of the inhalation muscles. Because if the inhalation muscles just release, you'd get, and all the air would escape. And so 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when we inhale, the inhalation muscles of the diaphragm and our external intercostals, which is a little sciencey right now, but a diaphragm and external intercostals do need to still stay active. They need to still be active to provide the resistance of the yeah for the airflow. Okay, so the easy way of saying your fancy intercostals would be put your hands on your hips and squeeze those things that are sometimes above your, they're above the love handles. That would be about the spot. It's like almost yeah. obliques, but more. That's right. That's right. And they shouldn't just, after you exhale, they shouldn't just go whoo like that. They should still stay suspended. Yeah. Oh, I love the word suspended. Not in a bad term. Not like when you're yeah. suspended from school, but suspended no, like, no. like your intercostals. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And number three, are you ready? Yes. Number three is that good breath support is dependent on firm glottal closure. Let's talk about glottal because I still, when I first start singing on Sunday mornings in church choir, I am a glottal mess. (laughs) Uh, You know, the the term glottal closure, and there's going to be some science speaking here. And and if ever it gets just too sciencey. You just let me know and, and I'll break it down. But when we talk about glottal closure, the the image that I use for singers is to put two fingers together and that's their glottis, right? Their vocal folds have to close all the way. If, they're, if there's a little bit of space in between here, that's where air escapes, right? So we're looking down at the instrument here. Mm-hmm. And so if there's air, air will, if there's space, air will escape. So when we talk about firm glottal closure, it's just that the vocal folds come all the way together. Yeah. Okay. And this is here. I hope you're watching the YouTube because this is some great visuals. If you're not, (laughs) you'll just have to trust us. Yes, that's right. So how do you get that without stressing it and like flapping it closed? I'm so glad you asked that question. You know, there's, I'm going to reference some historical literature. There was an exceptional, one of the most renowned vocal pedagogues of, of all of, of, vocal pedagogy literature. His name is Manuel Garcia II. And he taught this thing called the coup de la glotte. And it was very controversial. But now modern science has reinforced that it's very safe if done correctly. The coup de la glotte is when we say the word uh uh-oh. Uh-oh. When we, yeah, when we say uh uh-oh, there is not an aspiration of uh ho, right? Right. The vocal folds come together. Like if you think about the word uh oh, and you're about to speak it in very slow mo, what happens is your vocal folds close together and then air moves, and that's what separates and starts a vibration of the folds. And so when we say uh oh, that's what happens. And then the opposite to that is obviously the glottal, where the vocal folds slam together on the onset, and we don't want that. No, this. No. Okay, so do you ever use uh uh-oh in a warm-up? Yes, yes, you do. So you have the singers sing the word word, uh uh-oh, and or if you're hearing a lackluster phonation onset, then you can just have them say, speak uh uh-oh, close the folds, which I work with a lot of voice majors and some grad voice students in the choirs, and so I can simply say, make sure you close the glottis before you start, and they can do that. But if you're working with middle schools, high schools, then say, uh oh, or or have them sing oh, whatever it is. Oh, cool. Okay, I'll let you know. So I'm gonna have a rap coming your way here shortly, and then I'm gonna have oh an uh oh warm up. Just watch for the follow up. Watch for the follow up. <laughs> I'm ready for this, and I'm I will use your uh oh warm up in my choirs. So I'm pretty excited. It's it's kind of up there marinating right now. It'll be ready by the time we're done. I love it. I love it. Okay, so we got our three pieces of the breathing and support. So what is number four on our list of seven essentials? Let me just say one more thing before we leave the breathing. You know, I I will say this for our conductor friends out there. It is important that we rehearse in full phrases because Mm. our students take in, our singers take in air to sing a full phrase and for them to continually train their muscles, train their mechanism, we have to let them sing all the way through a phrase and then let's cut them off and say, okay, the onset wasn't clean or whatever Mm. it is. But rehearsing in phrases will also build breath management for the students. Rehearsal in phrases, that's fantastic. I am so bad at that. I'm like, oh, that was so bad, stop. (laughs) Or we hey, all I get, sometimes I get so excited that we have to have a party dance because they did that, something. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's and that's so point. key. Yeah. 
Yeah. You can party dance love, at the end of the phrase. <laughs> that's right. And I love that you will stop them to tell them good things. I think that's so important in, in excellent classroom culture. Well, thank you. I'm really excited about drawing in. I have some students from Guatemala that I can't wait to use what you gave me as ideas, but I don't want to go backwards. We have to go yes. forwards. Otherwise, I think you and I could talk all day, which means I you're going to so have too. to come back on the show, which is pretty I, awesome. I would love that. I would love all right, that. So we've talked warm up, alignment, breath and support. What's number mm-hmm. four? Number four is obviously the development of the tone quality, development of tone. And I start this whole section off by talking about the larynx, talking about the laryngeal position. So the larynx we know has tremendous impact on the vocal tract quality because the larynx houses the vocal folds. So where it resides, if it's high, if it's low, will drastically impact tone quality. And Elite classical singing calls for, of course, a low, stable larynx at all times. I talk to the students and the singers about this, but as we sing scales, you know, the tendency is for our larynx to raise with the pitch and lower with the pitch. And so how do we train our mechanism to stay stable through a five note, through an octave scale, through an octave leap even? And so understanding low, stable larynx will positively contribute to vowel quality. And in fact, this goes back to what you and I said earlier, it aids in choral blend. Okay, how do you teach that though? Because I'm thinking like, we do our little warm-up sequence and then we play all of our solfege games. Like how fast can you in tune sing a major scale, minor scale, chromatic scale, and thirds? <laughs> um, it's totally a competition and it's all my oh fault. Oh my goodness. And we have to start over if they lose good vowel shape, but I've never thought about the fact that they could be losing good vowel shape due to their larynx. So what are some ways that you fix that and get it low and stable? Yeah, yeah. So I have four solutions for you. Okay. One is the yawn size. So having them, you know, the yawning, when we yawn, our muscles automatically engage the, the larynx to lower. So having the students yawn and then release their air, and I will have them sing it on an aval. And so that's one way to start to teach you know, and I'll have them do an octave descending scale. And so that's one way to teach them how to start an upper note, so the octave note on a lo- with a low larynx. Number two is for our kinesthetic learners out there, which I was a kinesthetic learner. I don't know if you are, totally. but I will have them palpate their thyroid cartilage. And the thyroid cartilage is the larynx. It's just the outside part of the larynx, right? So you have the thyroid cartilage on the outside and then the larynx is right behind it. And so have them touch it with their index finger or have them put their palm on it so they can feel it as they sing. And singers can feel the the mechanism move up and down as they sing. So for our kinesthetic learners, there's number two. If we're introducing the concept and our students don't know about it yet, I'll have them do these three things, these three steps. One, close their lips open their teeth, and inhale deeply through the nose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm following all the directions. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, you know, it's a survival instinct. We do that because our brain says, oh, we've closed our airway. We have to maximize how much air we're going to take in through our nose. And when we lower our larynx, the term lower your larynx and open throat are the same thing. So, yeah, that's right. And so our our students we as humans when we do those three things it will automatically open our throat and lower our larynx when we inhale the air close your lips open your teeth inhale through your nose yes kind of sounded a little bit like darth vader over here but i had a nice open throat you could hear just air intake i love it and then i'll I'll tell you the last one is our o and u vowels utilizing those as neutral syllables those two vowels encourage the lowest larynx out of all, you know, five of the pure vowels that, that we typically use in warm-ups. Good to and know. Um, yes, it's very good to know because it, I, I think that that is a critical element for me, at least as a pedagogue, when I'm thinking about neutral syllables, especially at the start of semester where you and mm-hmm. I, you know, we're recording this at the end of August when mm-hmm. we're training our singers to develop healthy vocalism using those two will really help to establish that lower larynx. It also makes sense, too, if you're thinking about the songs you teach to develop tone. You're thinking like Wind on the Hill. No one can tell me. Nobody knows. 
and there's yeah. all those oohs inside of it, or that yeah. makes so much sense now, but now there's the science to back it up. Oh, that's, that's right. so cool. Y'all, I'm about to go on a mission to hunt down all the ooh songs. <laughs> yes. Let me know what you find. I, I will uh, hop on that train as well. That's so cool. Okay. So developing tone, you've given us how to get the larynx nice and low. Is there anything else in the tone category? Yes. Yes. I've got a a little bit more. So sustained tone exercises and portamentos. So sustained tone exercises, you know, singing one pitch on a vowel will develop breath management and tone quality. It's a two for one. It will develop essential number three that we just talked about Mm -hmm. and tone development. And it, it just has to do with our main singing muscle, which is the thyroarytenoid muscle, commonly known as the TA muscle. Yes. Cool. Thyroarytenoid. Here, I'll type it for you here. Thyroid. Yeah, I'm feeling super smart. Like, I've always wanted to take this type of class, but I didn't have time in my schedule. So we are getting a crash course. That's a well, very long word. This is awesome. It's, it's a long word. You could just call it the TA muscle. That's okay, what it's typically known as. Yeah, t- TA muscle, also called the vocalis muscle. All that, same thing. But um, just, you know, singing a pitch, like singing, of course, an O vowel on one pitch and just having the singer sustain it for a while. You know, if they're advanced, you can have them practice Mesa on that as well. Um, Those are all excellent ways to just help them continually build the vocal folds vibrating against each other. Okay. So that's the sustain, sustaining exercises. Yeah. Sustain tone exercises. And, and, you know, I would also be remiss in not mentioning the portamento, which we all know is, a slide and that develops the other main singing muscle which is the cricothyroid muscle i'll type T- that for you as cta well. can do we ct it... muscle okay close C-T well done muscle. dr birch that's right oh, so <laughs> ct <laughs> muscle <laughs> ct muscle the portamento and that's our pitch that's our pitch changing muscle that's the one that helps us change pitches quickly and fastly okay. so portamento Your flexibility you know, muscle Exactly. Basically. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So the TA yeah. sustains and mm-hmm. the CT moves. Yeah. Yeah. And really the T the TA muscle is a main singing muscle. If you develop that one, then all of the it's like that's the full body. I use this analogy all the time. That's the full body workout. When you mm. exercise a TA muscle, it's a full body workout. Whereas something like a portamento exercising the CT muscle is more of an isolation exercise, like a bicep curl. Okay. Yeah. That makes total sense. I love it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So then what? Where do we go from there? So now that we've, you know, that, done full body and isolations. Yes. Yes. Glottal closure. We talked about this with the uh, breathing as well as one of the the third element of breathing pedagogy that's really good. And of course it impacts tone quality, right? Mm -hmm. Firm glottal closure, meaning the folds are closed all the way together. Mm -hmm. This is for our friends watching on YouTube for the visual. Close all the way together produces a brilliant ringing tone quality and loose glottal closure where it's slightly separated or not firmly coming together, breathy. That's where we hear breathiness, a weaker veiled tone quality. And the way that we build this are through staccato gestures, where the students close the TA muscle, close mm-hmm. the glottis prior to phonation. So instead okay. of ha, 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 it's a, a, a. Ooh, yeah. fun. Yeah. Okay, very cool. You know, you haven't talked yet about placement. Is that coming? Does that matter at all? You know, it's it's. I'm so glad you asked that question. That was something that in all of my pedagogy classes was never a core tenet of good vocal pedagogy. And it doesn't mean that it's not an important concept. It's just that that's more of a secondary or tertiary affect to simple, basic foundational pedagogy. And so the way that, you know, my, my teacher, I studied with Stephen Austin, the way that he taught it was placement is determined by the vowel quality that we use. So, the low larynx, you've heard the term chiaroscuro, right? Mm-hmm. Light and dark. The low larynx contributes, creates a darker, warmer tone quality, and that's balanced by a bright, clear vowel placement. So I I often will have the singers speak, ah, ah, you know, speak a clear vowel instead of oh, oh. 
And that is that is a way to establish easy placement. But, okay. you know, I think that if you build these foundations, that placement will come naturally to the singers. So it's kind of like doing all of your drills first. These seven essentials are basically drills that lead to everything you need to put it together to do the double, double flip, flip thing off the bar. beam. That's exactly right. These are the foundations. These are the, the essentials before. And then from there you can explore. And, you know, once the singers have these seven essentials and once we as conductors have these seven essentials in our brains, then we can ask for, you know, a more forward placement, like you're saying, a, a more backward placement, whatever it is that, that you want as an artist. I love it. Okay. Warm up one. Alignment, two. Breath and support, breathing and support, three. Development of tone is four. We're over halfway. I can't believe it. What's five? Uh, Could I just visit a couple other things? Oh, yeah, no. I don't want to scoot you on if there's more. I'm learning so much right now. Okay, there are three... Three other elements to to the tone quality. I mean, this is obviously the biggest section, right? Right. And so uh, I'll quickly go through the the next three. Semi-occluded vocal tract exercise in the development of tone. And you you know this. You're now an expert at vocal pedagogy. But these SOVTs, these partial obstructions of the vocal opening, I'll read you the benefits of them. They are, we can achieve more acoustical output with less vocal effort. Oh, that's important. there's less pressure that's required to initiate and sustain phonation. Using an SOVT allows for our vocal tracts to become highly tuned so that we can find the singer's formant easier. And there's a higher ratio of the TA muscle activation to the CT muscle activation. Which we now understand all of that. Yes. Like that all makes so much sense. Yeah. Yeah. And so... You know, most choir directors use this already. And I would say, go farther. So apply it in the middle of rehearsal. You know, have the choir start a phrase on a lip trill and then halfway through open to text and see if they can sustain that same sensation, that same quality of tone. I love this idea. I love lip trills in general. We usually make lip trill roller coasters. Obviously, I'm working with smaller people. But... It's a lot of fun to also tell each other about your day yeah. using a lip trill and you tell them <laughs> all about what you did. You brushed your teeth. Good job. And then what? And it's so funny to see their expression open up. Oh, how funny. And watch them tell you about their day and try to imagine what they're saying with lip trills. But I've n- That is so funny. Is you the, know, Go ahead. No, I was going to say that... I think the secondary effects of, of lip trills that people don't recognize or, or any SOVTs, semi-occluded vocal tract exercises, is that they do, they accomplish several things too. They naturally lift the soft palate. Mm-hmm. You have to lift the soft palate to do it. Um, it naturally relaxes all of these muscles mm-hmm. in the jaw, the masseter muscle, and and it just creates that steady airflow that we all know, of course. And so with all those, you know, it's... It's no wonder why it's so widely used and how can we continue to use this? Um, You know, which leads us into our next point, the activation of the singer's formant, which have you heard of this term singer's formant before? Yes, I have heard that term, but you better give it a definition because I bet that's a little bit. You know, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. And and for our listeners and and our YouTube friends who are watching this, the, the singer's formant is what allows an opera singer to sing without a microphone. And there are certain things that we have to do to access the singer's formant, right? Which the singer's formant lies in the 2,500 to 3,500 hertz range. If you're, you know, measuring it with a, uh, uh, like, hertz a chart, then it's 2,500 to 3,500. But to do that, to activate that, we have to lower the larynx. We already talked about that. Narrow the epilarynx tube. Widen the pharynx. The pharynx is the space back here, which I described as a space by the wisdom teeth, widen that yeah. pharynx, slightly close the mouth. This is the this is the, the 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 point that I want I hope our listeners take home with them. But to activate the singer's point, we actually have to slightly close the mouth. And I'll come back to that. We have to raise the soft palate, of course, and we have to sing with firm glottal closure, which we already talked about. And Ingo Tietze calls this the inverted megaphone shape inverted mega i'm writing that down i'm an inverted megaphone yeah inverted megaphone shape all right 
go back to what you said you had to tell us more about closing the mouth. Yeah, so when we sing, I was guilty of this early on in my teaching, but we often say, drop your jaw, drop your jaw, drop your jaw for everybody. And actually, when we sing like that, it creates a regular megaphone shape and it actually disperses our resonance and disperses the singer's formant. And so unless you're a soprano that's singing a high C, you really don't need to, you know, you do need to modify above the staff for sopranos, but unless you're a treble voice singing above the staff, you don't need to modify. You don't need to open the mouth so wide. And so with a slightly closed mouth, it allows for us to widen the pharynx and that's what creates the megaphone. You notice how the opening here is smaller and then it widens to the back of the wizard's teeth. So basically peace, put a peace sign up and then put the crack of your fingers where your teeth yeah. are and your fingers will then point towards your ear. But I highly recommend watching this on YouTube because Francis is awesome to watch as he's cheap. <laughs> I'm sorry for our, our non-YouTube <laughs> friends right now that can't see the visuals, but you know. Very helpful. This- inverted megaphone. I'm a stinking inverted megaphone. I'm going to love on that phrase yeah. all semester. It will change the way the choirs sing. So is that number five, the singer's format, accessing the singer's format, or is that still part of tone? That is still part of tone because that when we sing with optimal tone, we access the singer's format. You know, and I would be remiss in men- not mentioning nasality as a part of this. Of course, we know that nasality is bad. Nasality introduces what are called anti-resonances into mm-hmm. the singing spectrum. So, you know, eliminating nasality by lifting the soft palate all the way absolutely key. And the tip that I give to educators is to pinch the nose and have the choir sing sing a phrase. And if they're pinching the nose and they're singing nasally, their sound will stop where they'll feel the vibration right here. So pinching the nose will really, really help. Um, as conductors, we often use imagery in rehearsals as well. Imagine like you're singing this to a loved one. Imagine like you're singing to somebody 50 feet away. We use these these ideas to create artistry in our singers. And I think that's beautiful. And as vocal pedagogues as well, we should be aware that there are times when imagery doesn't help develop Mm -hmm. good vocal pedagogy. And, uh, you know, Richard Miller says this, he says, a major source of misunderstanding with regard to resonance in singing stems from confusing the source of the sound with the sensation of the sound. Mm. So we as vocal pedagogues have to understand how to teach what is the source of the sound, you know, lower the larynx instead of saying like, okay, pretend like you are singing like Darth Vader, right? (laughs) So we, we, we have to have the terminology to use vocal pedagogy terms that are backed by science, that are backed by historical mm-hmm. pedagogy to develop that in our singers. And that's pretty much the end of the tonal, uh, the fourth section, if you will. Okay, well, I think I have this a little idea here. So yeah. Yeah. as you're teaching all of these um, SVOVTs and everything, mm-hmm. if you're working with younger singers, it's like sounding like a race car. Mm-hmm. And the engine. And then mm-hmm. you gave us the Darth Vader. Yeah. And then the reverse megaphone, these are all great images that are centered not just on what sound we want to hear as choir directors, but on really sound pedagogy. And when you're right. talking about communicating your value and making sure that the people in your space know why it's important to be in your space, this is great stuff. I mean, I wish I would have had some of these words like the TA muscle and the CT muscle at my last parent meeting when I could have just like tossed out some big words for them (laughs) you're so funny you know i I love that phrase that you use communicating your value and as as collegiate directors both you and i know that continuing to facilitate our relationship with our voice colleagues is absolutely fundamental Mm -hmm. and knowing that we work on the same team and one of the best compliments i ever got from my voice colleague here at the university of memphis she said the singers who have been singing in university singers with you are singing much better in their voice lessons as a result as well and these concepts transfer to solo singing and choral singing and it's Mm -hmm. treating the instrument and building it as a whole so that our singers can with facility, move between choral singing, solo singing, whatever the demands are. 
I say singing in the car healthily. I always feel so sad when you get that younger singer that's like, my voice is just so tired. And you hear how they've been talking. They've probably been screaming in the car the whole way. Uh, And this provides us with tools to help all ages of singers find their their most authentic sound, most healthy and authentic sound. Oh, I love this section on tone. Do you have time to give us five, six, seven? Yeah, let's do it. And these are much smaller than those. So obviously choral blend is the most distinctive aspect of choral singing. And the key to choral blend, I always ask people this, the key to choral blend, vowels. We have to first sing the right vowels and then we have to sing the right vowels together, right? And so that is the key to choral blend. Instead of everybody singing softer, everybody singing softer, which just truncates the voice and just cuts everyone's sound off at the knees. If we match vowels, the choral blend will come. Of course, we have to take into account vowel modification for sopranos, which we mm-hmm. talked about above the staff. You know, I, I always say that when we get to like above the staff, that's when the jaw really starts needing to drop. And there's science behind the formants that occur at that range. I'll save you all of that. Just know that at the top of the staff, at the top, we drop. Chop at the top is a phrase I use. So all the sopranos know that. All the treble voices know that phrase. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, placement of singers as well. Using voice placement to place them in a place to where they can contribute fully and you don't have to say sing softer, sing softer, sing softer. I love doing voice placement and it's such a fun way of just you get them. And if you've never done voice placement, you should totally send me a message on emilybridge.org slash contact. We'll talk about it. But it changes. And you talked earlier about student choice, letting the students hear and make those adaptations. That's just game changing. And people knowing, oh, I can stand next to this person. I can't stand next to this person. Right. Huge. Right. And there's there's a term for it. It's called circumambient spacing. Circumambient spacing. Oh, my vocabulary is exponentially larger. <laughs> You're so funny. Circumambient spacing. It just means that it's two feet all around you. Two feet side to side, two feet uh, um, behind you. And so circumambient spacing, we know all about this because we are emerging, starting to emerge from a pandemic. And so it's just a scaled down version of social distancing. But with the right people around you and the right spacing, then your blend right. doesn't That's happen right. by sing louder, sing softer, but by right. proper technique. Right. right. I love it. Okay. So then we've gotten through five. Is there anything else in the choral blend arena that you want to share? Hmm. I'll, I'll share with you this one quote that I love. Ingo Tite says, the ear drives the blend more than overt manipulation of the larynx or articulators. The ear drives the blend. That's so yeah. key. Yeah. So key. Yeah. So, and then that kind of puts the bed number five. Okay. The ears. Yeah. Okay. And then six. I can't believe we're nearing the end. I know. Me either. Six, musical acuity. Uh, and this is simply teaching our singers musicianship skills that allow for them to understand, you know, vowel timing, vowel sound, uh, when does it occur, right? And so oftentimes, if we sing a late consonant, or if we have a lax breath, all of that will also contribute to, to poor vocal development. So teaching, you know, this quote I love is, the more precise the ensemble rhythm, the more concentrated the sound. The more Mm. rhythmically precise the vowel and pitch, the more convincing the sound. Yeah. This is why I love IPA. I love putting IPA, like even with English, where exactly we want the different vowel shapes to go. And even my youngest singers, fourth grade is my youngest singers. They get IPA and we have little hand signs and stuff that go with all the IPA things. But when you do a diphthong and you know where the vowel is supposed to go, they hear that sounding better. And cleaner, That's right. but you've given us that musical acuity is such a fancy way of saying that. Yeah, yeah, and and I, your the fact that you use IPA, I love it because I do too. All of my singers oh. learn IPA too. Yep, and we have little hand signs for it, which is hilarious. Because oh when we goodness. start talking about it, someone will be like, "It's the E sound. We need more E in that ah or something really funny." But I love IPA, and now I can call it musical acuity, and it's the sixth step for essentially developing voice within choir. Yes, yes. Are you ready for number seven? 
I'm sad that it's ending, but yes, I'm ready for number seven. I know. This is this one is for our, all of our conducting colleagues and friends out there. The importance of our gesture, our model and, and our gesture. You know, mirror neurons, we know our students will mirror whatever they see over an extended amount of time. So our posture, right? There's power in our gesture as well. And I often, I always ask this question. I always say, what is the most common fault for choral conductors? And the answer is that our gesture is too high. Mm. We talk about this concept. I talk about this concept being the breath circle, right? Our gesture residing around where our diaphragm naturally expands. When we conduct around that area, that produces a sound that, that encourages that abdominal contraction, the and then the chest releasing as well. When we conduct too high, it actually makes the singers breathe clavicularly. And Ooh. so, yeah. Clavicularly low- being your clavicle, like the up here, like way that's up right. in the that's shoulders. Right. Okay. Where our singers will go, oh, right? Oh. And and for our friends listening to the podcast, my shoulders are going up as I breathe. But, uh, you know, when we as conductors conduct that high, that's what we're encouraging and Mm -hmm. so when we lower our gesture around that breath circle then it allows for our singers to more freely engage in that in that breathing mechanism and when we conduct around that breath circle it encourages a low larynx which goes back to multiple tips that's exactly right that's exactly right so try this exercise everyone that's listening everyone that's watching go back conduct your choir on a phrase conduct it by your head Go back, conduct it by your belly button, by the breath circle. You will, he- and then ask the singers what they felt. Singer choice. <laughs> That's right. Ask the singers what they felt. Um, listen to the way the sound changes as well. It will change the way that your choir sings if you conduct consistently around the breath circle. Wow. This has been the most fast blasted vocal pedagogy for choir people episode I've ever done, but I've taken, I think I've taken seven pages of notes. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I'm honored. I'm honored. This was so good. And exactly I know what I needed having been stuck in the, you know, beginning of school, getting everything started, picking the repertoire, doing the community building, getting to know you, blah, 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 getting syllabi perfect. And to not, to not have to restart everything, but to see where things I'm doing are here. But how can I slightly change the order? Because we talked about order matters. Right, right. To best impact my singers to find their yeah. best voice. This is so good. I have other ideas. You're ha- you're gonna have to come back. I would love that. I had a blast today, and it's you're you're a pure joy to talk to, and just just like I said, fast friends. This is this has been so fun. Well, I am so excited. You get one last chance. I always let the guest give the listener one thing that really really matters that you want them to take away from this episode. Hmm. One thing, one thing, developing your singers to sing with a low larynx, having, and and with that, having the ear to to understand and, and differentiate between a sound with a high larynx, a sound with a low larynx, that if we just start with that one thing, a drastic change will take place. And then the other ones can help guide. But that one thing would be my biggest takeaway for this. And I love that it all starts because by providing these seven tips to us, we're then able to provide them to our singers, which allows them to show up more confident, more capable, and to hopefully sing forever. Yeah. Oh, this was so much fun. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Emmy. It was such a pleasure. Yeah. I don't even know how to wrap this episode up. We talked about how to bring people together and help them be seen by recognizing their culture and allowing their culture to infiltrate everything that you do. We talked about why it's important to develop good vocal habits and good vocal pedagogy through the warm up and through breathing and support. And I forgot one. Oh, alignment. Oh, heavens. Let me start that over. Warm up, alignment, breathing and support, development of tone, choral blend, but not the shush type of choral blend musical acuity, and our gesture and model. I hope you learned something. I'm dying to know what you learned. You can reach me at emilyburch.org slash contact. You can find out more about Dr. Kathleen and the episode notes. You can get more at 
pie. <laughs> I can't even do words. You can get more if you go over to patreon.com slash musicedmatters. I'm just so overwhelmed with this great content, and I hope that you've enjoyed it. But above all, I hope that you know you matter. We all know that music matters, especially excellent vocal pedagogy within the choral rehearsal. And I will see you next time on Music It Matters Podcast.